Hello, everyone. Welcome to our stream. We are excited to see you all, well, be with you all this morning. And uh, this is our Friday, June 25th stream. Uh, my name is Matthew. Um, I am one of the course staff for our online classes, but we know that a lot of you join us from all over the place uh, from various different sources. We're um, just enthusiastic to be here with you today. Uh, Vicki is uh, helping out with our streaming, doing technical stuff. And um, Chris, I will let you welcome everyone and uh, we'll get started with questions. So post those questions in the chat. Okay, uh, greetings to everyone. Welcome to another live session for our online classes and anyone else who cares to join us. Um, ready to answer your questions about astronomy. Excellent, Lawrence 4040. Uh, has our first question for today and is on with us live. If entangled particles approach the event horizon of a black hole, can they get disentangled at the event horizon? And if so, is energy released? Um, that's a big question and it's an unknown answer. Um, so that you've hit on one of the sort of cutting edge research topics about black holes. Um, uh, Particle pair creation at the event horizon is the mechanism by which Hawking radiation gets released, um, essentially extracting energy from the vacuum from these virtual particle pairs. Um, that we don't know how to confirm that Hawking radiation exists. We don't know how to observe it. Uh, and now another issue has arisen because we know that quantum entanglement is possible. And so the question becomes what happens when quantum entanglement occurs near event horizon? And, and this is actually an area where black hole physics is incomplete because it's already known that in the theory of quantum mechanics, a particle interaction should proceed seamlessly forward and backwards uh, in time or reversing parity or reversing uh, charge or particle to antiparticle. Um, and yet that can't happen across an event horizon because information is lost through the event horizon. In the same vein, uh, entanglement is coherent information held between two particles. It can be, it's a mixed state essentially. And if part of that information is lost through the event horizon, then technically all the information should be lost. And so the resolution of this issue in some theories is that there's a firewall around the event horizon. Uh, there's an actual uh, mechanism whereby information and radiation is incoherently created that essentially destroys the information. Um, so the best supposition is that entanglement is not possible across the event horizon of a black hole because that would violate the, the principle uh, that information is hidden and inaccessible within the event horizon. Excellent. The next question is from an email that we received from one of our students, uh, Hernan is uh, asking about the Galilean moons, Io, Europa, and Ganymede, which are all three in a state of resonance. Um, and the question is, how does this resonance so conveniently occur? Uh, how do they sort of coincidentally fall into a multiple of each other? And how does it you know, block them together when the rocky planets of our solar system are obviously not in any form of resonance? Um is a good question. Resonance is an interesting phenomenon of, uh, of dynamics of rocky objects in the solar system and beyond. Um, a resonant configuration essentially is when multiple orbiting bodies uh, have orbital periods that are the ratios of whole numbers, two to one, three to two, four to three, six to nine, could be any ratio of integers. Um, and at that point, uh, there's, there's sort of reinforcement of that resonance. Um, and so that becomes a sort of stable configuration. The reason that uh, orbital resonance are seen in the moon systems of the giant planets is because they're all, the gravity is strong. So, so resonance it works better when the gravity is strong and small moons are responding therefore to the large gravity of the planet itself. And second, the, or, the objects are fairly densely packed in space. So the moons of Jupiter and Saturn are fairly close to the giant planet. So that sort of increases the odds that any two of them will happen to sit near a resonance or fall into a resonance. The planets in the solar system are very widely spaced and the gravity from the sun is actually relatively weaker. 
So that's not as favorable a situation for resonance. There's a partial resonance between uh, Pluto and Neptune. Um, it's not a perfect resonance. It's not as coherent as the ones in the inner solar system. The fact that this happens when the gravity is strong and the objects are fairly closely packed is reinforced by exoplanets because there are now more than a dozen exoplanet, multiple planet systems where there are resonances, orbital resonances, just like those in the Galilean moons, very similar. Uh, and some, there's a, there's even a chain of six resonances, I think, in a seven planet ex, seven exoplanet system. So these are all hot Jupiters. These are exoplanets on close, tight orbits. So that state agrees with that premise previously stated. So we do know of orbital resonances of planets, but they tend to be on ex exoplanet systems on tight, close orbits where they're densely packed. Excellent, and that perfectly answered our uh, the second part of his question, which is could exoplanets uh, be seen in resonance? So thank you. Uh, the next question is from uh, Wiedemann, or Wiedemann, who asks, in our observable large-scale structure, are there more sheets or voids? Um, there are both. I'm not sure it's easy to say whether there's more of one or the other because um, the sheets delineate structures in almost two dimensions. The dimensionality of large-scale structure in the universe, if you assign like a fractal dimension to it, uh, where one is a string or a one-dimensional line, two is a sheet, and three is a filled volume, the dimensionality of large-scale structure in the universe is about 1.7. In other words, it's it's not quite sheet-like and it's not string-like. It's a little closer to sheets than strings. Sort of you can imagine pizza dough with holes in it stretched out and kind of a little bit stringy. And the space between the sheets is indeed usually devoid of galaxies. So sheets do delineate regions of low density where there happen to be few galaxies. Um, this condition of strings, filaments, sheets, and voids is imposed essentially by dark matter, by the evolution of structure in the universe over a large period of time, um, where the peaks in the density distribution enhance the probability that a galaxy will form. And the term for this technically is the galaxy formation is biased by the role of dark matter. And so that's what leads visible galaxies to concentrate in these sheet-like and structures that outline voids. The voids are not completely empty. There are some dwarf galaxies in the voids. And the voids do, of course, have some dark matter in them. But they're very short on visible matter because the density compared to cosmic density is quite low. Excellent. Thank you very much. The next question is from an email. Andrea Charor asks about um, astronomy careers. And uh, we have answered this before, but it's been a little while. So I think it would be um, good to kind of address this again. Uh, she'd like to know, if I wanted to help put astronauts on Mars, what kind of careers would be good fits? What kind of degrees would help me to have those kinds of careers? So the idea of participating in the next stage of the space program, which is largely going to be played out in the private or the commercial sector, that's a good question because these companies like SpaceX and Blue Origins, they're growing. They they have hundreds and they're heading towards thousands of employees. And this is a growing sector. And there's 30, about three dozen actually, space companies worldwide that are all in the posture of growing as they develop a commercial enterprise. The skill set that would be required to work for a company like SpaceX, of course, predominantly involves technical skills. Most of their employees are engineers, as it turns out. Um, Elon Musk did engineering physics in, in, as a student. So engineering and physics are core disciplines to work in the space industry. But since it's a fully fledged industry and essentially a service industry with tourism and recreation behind it, they also need publicists, advertising people, um, they need people to understand their safety systems. They have to worry about health issues because they're putting people in space and they have to monitor the health and provide recourse if someone has a medical problem while in one of their spaceships. So there are definitely roles for health professionals too. There are also roles for legal people with legal expertise because this new industry is going to be subject to regulation at some point and they need to self-regulate until governments put rules in place. 
and they also have to worry about liability and litigation and, and various things like that. So there's actually a pretty wide range of jobs in the space sector. The goal of putting people on Mars is, is a goal that Elon Musk and SpaceX have stated for maybe 15 to 20 years from now. Um, so if, in terms of a single company to work for, that's probably the best one. They're doing very well at the moment. And Elon Musk is the world's uh, second richest man, I think. $175 billion net worth. He has deep pockets so he can make his dreams happen. The next question is from Student McLeod, who's on with us live. Um, the question is about telescopes, and uh, he, uh, they hear that uh, binocular viewers are becoming popular for uh, telescope viewing. Um, just theoretically, would each eye receive only half the light collected by the primary mirror or objective lens, resulting in a much dimmer view of the object being viewed? Well, it could be that way uh, if it was simple or binoculars in the sense that you might buy to view the night sky. But also you can have uh, the full light delivered with a, a beam splitter or a prism to both eyepieces. Um, and then that, it does distribute the light, but you're getting the full light, the full depth of the image. So it's not necessarily true that you, you see less deeply uh, using binocular vision. Uh, Space Time, who's on with us live, asks, um, can the laws of quantum mechanics be applied to the macroscopic world? Um, there is an idea or a principle called the correspondence principle in physics, and that came at the beginning of quantum theory in the 1920s and 30s. And it stated that regardless of the rules of quantum mechanics or quantum theory, and there's, there's a lot of strangeness there, and quantum entanglement is one example, uncertainty principle is another. Um, the sort of probabilistic nature of measuring quantities is another. In the end, all of those uncertainties and strange behaviors have to map to the more deterministic and repeatable and reliable behavior of the macroscopic world. And so the correspondence principle was in place right from the birth of quantum mechanics and it essentially stated that as you deal with large ensembles of particles or large systems of particles rather than individual atoms or small groups of atoms, their aggregate and average properties start to recreate classical physics. And we've been able to demonstrate that in the lab now, that if you look at the behavior of sufficiently large uh, ensembles of particles, their behavior does become quite deterministic and, and is explained very well by classical physics. Uh, the next question is from Drew1618. Uh, could supermassive black holes have acted as particle accelerators in the quasar stage of a galaxy generating dark matter observed in galactic halos? Um, yes to the first part of the question. Um, supermassive black holes definitely operate as particle accelerators. We, we know because radio galaxies are galaxies that have emitted uh, jets of plasma, radio jets visible with radio telescopes, uh, out to very large distances, well beyond the galaxy, to distances of hundreds of thousands of uh, kiloparsecs, actually. Uh, and some of that material is moving at relativistic speeds. Uh, and that originates from the center of the galaxy where there's a supermassive black hole. So radio galaxies are examples of situations where the particle acceleration uh, is extraordinary because it sends jets of plasma far outside the visible galaxy. And we know in quasars that are not even radio sources, the same sort of thing is happening. So yes, uh, supermassive black holes do have uh, their gravity engines. Uh, they have, they're spinning, they have angular momentum, they evacuate their poles and they're able to focus, collimate and accelerate uh, jets of plasma to large distances and very high energies. Now that doesn't directly have any effect on dark matter because these are baryonic particles. These are normal particles, electrons typically, and protons. Um, and the dark matter of course doesn't interact with radiation. And so the dark matter is sort of immune from these effects. So the jets and the acceleration of particles by black holes really doesn't have very much impact on the dark matter in the halo of a galaxy. That dark matter in the halo of galaxy was pre-existing. That pretty much was there as the galaxy formed in the first place. 
We have lots of viewers today who are interested in black holes and uh, entanglement. So let's uh, keep going with these. We've got Remus Romania who asks if two particles are entangled and one of them passes the event horizon of a black hole, can they still communicate? So could the yeah. information still, you know, sort right. of be transmitted from that entanglement? Yeah, this is pretty much the question I answered right at the beginning. Um, and the answer is no. As far as we understand it, the event horizon is an, is an impermeable information barrier. So if entangled particles did approach the event horizon and one passed the event horizon, then presumably the entanglement would be lost. The entangled state would be lost. Uh, we don't know how this mechanism works. So essentially, we're just taking as a principle um, the sort of isolation part of the event horizon hypothesis that it represents a pretty impermeable information barrier. And since entangled particles represent coherent information between two particles, that information must be lost. Um, so you've talked about information just now. Uh, Lawrence uh, also would like to know uh, what happens to a particle um, as it approaches the singularity. I mean, do we have any information? It seems like we don't really know what's going on inside a black hole. Is there any any data or speculation? Um, I mean, I'll take this as a question about the singularity. Um, singularities are an interesting phenomenon in astrophysics and in relativity, essentially. Um, the model of a black hole is very simple. The black hole uh, at its heart has a singularity, which is a cusp of infinite density, uh, and is surrounded by a sphere, a not a physical barrier, but an information boundary called the event horizon. And really, those are the only two components of a black hole. The event horizon is fairly easy to understand. Um, the singularity is harder to understand. and when people started working on the theory of black holes emerging from general relativity, they were quite upset and worried by the appearance of singularity at the center of a black hole, as predicted by the theory, because that's, that's sort of not physically sensible. Um, Roger Penrose, a famous mathematician out of the University of Oxford, worked with Stephen Hawking decades ago on what are called the singularity theorems of general relativity. And this very important work uh, foundational work for general relativity showed that singularities are not just mathematical artifacts or they are pathological behaviors, but they're not mathematical artifacts. They're inevitable consequences of the theory of general relativity applied to collapsed stars. And they involve almost no assumptions and they appear routinely in all the calculations. So the singularity theorems of Penrose and Hawking really showed that singularities are unavoidable. They're just part of the theory. And we just have to accept that that's the case. Uh, singularities are essentially places where space time becomes pathological, where it reaches a cusp. You could have other types of singularities, which would involve rips or tears um, or edges of space time. We don't see any of those. Um, so black holes are the main place where we anticipate there is a singularity. Uh, Hawking's and Penrose's work and also showed that black holes are pretty inevitable consequence of the general theory of relativity. And it made the likelihood that they exist much higher. And he was recognized for this work by sharing the Nobel Prize, the Physics Nobel Prize in 2020. The next question is from an email. Rajiv Ball asks, why are galaxies in different shapes like ellipses or spirals, it seems so counterintuitive. Yeah, it seems arbitrary why galaxies have shapes at all. Why aren't they all just the simplest shape, which is spherical? Uh, they collapse symmetrically, they would be spherical. And in fact, elliptical galaxies are closest to this ideal. The reason we don't see perfectly spherical galaxies, although there are some that come quite close, is that the other component of a galaxy is its rotation or angular momentum. Material swirling around in the early universe before it collapses into gas clouds is subject to turbulence. And this turbulence will in, import or impart a small amount of angular momentum to a large diffuse region of gas. As that gas collapses, conservation of angular momentum says it will spin faster. And that's why the, the objects that become galaxies forming out of diffuse gas clouds with turbulent motion 
will have some angular momentum, and that's why they will not tend to be spherical. And so we have elliptical galaxies. Those are the easiest objects to explain because they form essentially by a spherical or quasi-spherical collapse with some angular momentum. And so some elliptical galaxies are quite elongated and some, the E zeros, are almost perfectly spherical. Spiral galaxies are a little different, but they do have a spherical component. The spherical component of spiral galaxies is their halo. And their halo includes most of their mass, because that's the dark matter, and that is an enormous spherical configuration, and the halo stars, including the globular clusters that orbit elliptically. So the only component of galaxies that isn't spherical or nearly spherical is, of course, the disk of spiral galaxies. And that disk forms from subsequent collapse and from mergers as well. The disk of spiral galaxies are built over time by the ingestion or merger of smaller dwarf galaxies. And the gas settles into a disk. Again, angular momentum says there will be a rotation axis and the preferential collapse occurs in the equatorial plane. So again, it's angular momentum that leads to the fact that there are disks of galaxies that do also have a nearly spherical component. Um, and that explains the main difference between the two basic types of galaxies. Next question is from a live participant. Ranganathan Rama asks, in the immediate aftermath of the Big Bang, the universe expanded at several times the speed of light, and it continues to expand now, uh, making the observable universe a small portion of the whole. So what do we really mean when we say that we are seeing star births close to 11 billion light years away and being closer to the Big Bang? Uh, it's true that the early cosmic expansion was superluminal, which is to say regions of space-time, two points in space-time, were moving apart faster than the speed of light, which does not violate any rule of physics because special relativity only applies to what are called inertial frames in the local universe. General relativity governs the cosmic expansion and it puts no speed limit on the expansion of space-time. So yes, we have regions of space-time moving apart faster than light. The acceleration decelerates uh, over time because of the influence of dark matter, and then late in the universe, it accelerates again due to dark energy. But while it's decelerating, that lets us see more distant regions. So when we look out in space, we look out to large fractions of the history towards the Big Bang. The most distant galaxies we can see are about 12, 12 and a half billion light years, or what, uh, 12 billion years old, which is 90% of the age of the universe. And the interesting thing is that the light that we now see from those old galaxies when they were young occurred when the universe was expanding faster than light. And it's only the fact that that expansion subsequently slowed down for billions of years that we were able to gather that light with our telescopes. The next question is from an email from Abdullah Siraj, who asks, what are your views on the recent theory that there is dark matter in the center of our galaxy instead of a supermassive black hole. And if that much amount of that uh, much dark matter is even present at such a small place, shouldn't it also collapse to form a black hole? Yes, this is a controversial. I think the jury is out on this. I've seen the paper that claims this, but it's, it's running against a pretty long history of accurate observations of the galactic center of the dynamics of stellar orbits that really do impute a dark mass. And that dark mass, the, the observations of orbits of stars near the galactic center don't say exactly what the dark mass in the center of the galaxy is. And so formally, yes, you could imagine it's dark matter instead of a black hole. But the density of the mass within a small distance, within less than a parsec of the galactic center, is such that a black hole is by far the most plausible explanation. Because we know there's a very high stellar density, and we know that those stars will eventually collide, collapse, and reach a cusp, which leads to a black hole. Dark matter does cluster according to gravity, but more weakly. And so the halos of galaxies that contain most of their mass in dark matter are much less centrally concentrated uh, than, than normal parts of galaxies, the visible parts where stars are. So it really is gonna require very special properties of dark matter for it to form a cusp in the center of any galaxy that might approximate the density of a black hole. And I think at the moment, most astronomers think that's an implausible reading of what dark matter is and how it behaves. And the black hole is still the more 
conventional explanation for what's going on in the center of our galaxy. The next question is from Anna, who is joining us from Italy. How are scientists sure that there are other worlds different from our solar system? Well, the detection and measurement of extrasolar planets or exoplanets has really progressed a lot since the first one was discovered in 1995. And so now we actually, beyond infrared, beyond indirect detection through the Doppler method and transits, we actually have imaging. And so I would give that as the best evidence that these worlds actually exist. For situations where the star is faint, and so relatively speaking, the planet is bright, or where the planet is on a wide orbit, so you can separate it, its reflected light from the light of the star, we've been able to use telescopes to suppress the central starlight and actually take images of the planets, and then take those images over time and watch the orbits. So imaging of exoplanets is really the evidence that these other worlds exist. And I think about 100 exoplanets have now been imaged. Uh, so that's probably the most convincing explanation that there are these other worlds. Now, we don't know any details of them from these images. They're far enough away and physically small enough that these images just show them as single pixels on the detector. But there's still pretty good evidence that they are exoplanets, other worlds around other stars. Uh, this next question is um, from an email. Christina Vislapu uh, asks about um, exoplanets, and there are some assumptions built in that we may have to sort of untangle from this question. Uh, as we know, our solar system layout is not typical throughout the universe, and that the layouts with super-Earths and hot Jupiters are more common. Now, they're more common in our detections. Uh, my question is why our solar system does not have any super-Earths when Jupiter <clears throat> on the move in the early solar system days displaced 99% of material in the asteroid belt and threw it towards the sun region. Right. Our solar system, we've taken the Copernican principle to heart over the years, and we tend to think that our part of the universe is typical. But our solar system may not actually be typical. And it's true that based on the statistics of exoplanets, uh, most exoplanet systems, and we have many exoplanets where there are multiple planets detected, will have a super-Earth or an object like that. And the solar system has nothing. The solar system has, has the Earth, Venus, which is almost a twin of the Earth, and then two much smaller terrestrial planets, Mercury and Mars. The absence of a super-Earth could just be down to the formation scenario. It just depends how that mass is distributed in the nebula that forms the star system. You could invoke Jupiter, the action of a giant planet, to eject a super-Earth from the system early on, and it will be very hard to prove that hypothesis because evidence of these early interactions and potential ejections is hard to find. But simulations show that it does happen. So indeed, uh, giant planets can eject planets, other planets, smaller interior planets, early in the evolution of a star system. So that's a hypothesis that will be very hard to prove, that Earth there was a super Earth in our solar system, and then Jupiter ejected it. It's equally possible that the formation and the distribution of gas and material in the solar nebula just did not accommodate the formation of a more massive planet in the inner solar system. Uh, the next question is from uh, Remus Romania again, who asks, um, how many types of water ice do we know of today? Um, I lost track of the total number. I think it's 12 or more. There's There are many forms of ice, and these are unusual states of ice that usually form under conditions of high pressure. Um, so the conventional ice, which the crystalline form of which is very familiar to everyone, it's the terrestrial form of ice, is um, just one of a set of forms of ice. Under high pressure uh, water, in a crystalline form can form different lattice shapes, different configurations. Um, ice 9 is perhaps the most exotic of these because ice 9 is a uh, situation which will propagate, a situation in which you start to nucleate ice 9 under conditions of very high pressure. Uh, it, the propagation of the formation of that crystal will propagate dramatically through a liquid and then turn it into this ice form very rapidly. Uh, this was invoked in Kurt Vonnegut, one of Kurt Vonnegut's books and stories about 
the idea that ice nine would be present on the earth and and would freeze the entire oceans of the earth if we did something wrong it was a clever science fiction idea of a, a real physics effect. The next question is from Wendy Traver, who sent an email asking, uh, I read that the rate of the expansion of the universe differs when calculated from the Big Bang forward versus in reverse. Um, is that true? And what explanation is there for this? Yes, there's a thing that's been called in the research literature, the Hubble tension, Hubble constant or Hubble parameter being the rate of expansion of the universe. The Hubble parameter is usually measured locally, and it was measured first by accurately by the Hubble Space Telescope, one of its key projects in the first decade of its existence. Um, so that's how you measure the expansion rate locally, and which means currently, long after the Big Bang. But you can also measure the expansion rate for observations of the microwave background in the early universe. And that's a measurement of the expansion rate when the universe was young, and, and the expansion rate was obviously much, much faster. Now, the model of the Big Bang expansion, if you know how much matter and energy in the universe, should smoothly connect the early expansion rate to the current expansion rate. And the Hubble tension involves the fact that they don't smoothly connect that the, uh, the in expansion rate inferred from the early universe observations is slightly higher than the one measured locally. It's not a large effect, but it's now considered to be more than three sigma, maybe four or five sigma, so it's highly significant. And that means there's some sort of a problem. It may be in the calibration of these distance measurements, the local one in particular. So nobody knows how the Hubble tension will be resolved. In several meetings over the last year, different groups have essentially dug in with more data and said, no, it's not going away. We still have this problem to resolve. So unfortunately, the jury's out. The most radical answer to this would be that there's some missing ingredient in our cosmology, and that is entirely possible. RoboSniper TR asks, how does the constant expansion of the universe limit our understanding and our ability to explore the universe? Well, the expansion of the universe limits our understanding because there are clearly areas beyond our horizon. So in the standard Big Bang model, there are regions of space-time that we have not seen and we cannot see with our telescopes. Uh, and because of the accelerating expansion, some of those regions of space-time will never be observable, no matter how long we wait, because the light will never reach us. So the nature of the expansion of the universe it definitely limits our information. And the other obvious limit to our information is that we observe distant light, uh, we observe distant universe as it was, not as it is. Distant light is old light. And so we don't have a contemporaneous measurement of galaxies nearby and galaxies far away, because the galaxies we see far away are older and we see them when they were younger. And that's a fundamental limitation. We can't compare like with like because of that. Excellent. Thank you very much. The next question is from uh, Wiedmond, who asks, or Wiedmond, who asks, do you think Hamiltonian time is real? Well, there, is a, there are different ways of, of formulating time, physics time. Um, the Hamiltonian that expresses time is usually done in the context of general relativity. And in general relativity, uh, time is a concept that, of course, is linked to space. So space-time is a, a combin, combined physical quantity, and the expression of time and the way it plays out de therefore depends on the gravitational situation and on the nature of the space-time you occupy. Um, so there are formalisms in general relativity to, to deal with time in this complex way. Um, but it makes it more complicated in the calculation that you cannot fully separate the time evolution or the nature of the time from the space that it's embedded in and plays out in. Uh, the next question is, um, it's more of a statement, but uh, I think they would like you to just comment your thoughts on it. Um, it seems likely that if we ever encounter aliens, they will resemble artificial intelligence rather than little green Martians. What are your thoughts on this? 
Um, sure. I think we anthropomorphize aliens a lot. We tend to think that they're going to look like us, maybe slightly different skin color or size or shape. Um, they don't have to look like us at all. And indeed, it's possible since we are going through rapid evolution, which could lead to a, bi a post-biological phase where we develop machine intelligence and perhaps we are able to include what the equivalent of our brains in machines or computational arena, then life no longer has to take any particular shape. Um, and so post-biological life in the universe uh, could be very different from us, could be unrecognizable too. Uh, and I think that's something we actually have to take seriously. So Little Green Man is just now a caricature of what we think aliens might be. I don't think any astrobiologist thinks that these caricatures or archetypes are, are really plausible. Uh, the next question is from Remus Romania, who asks, how can we calculate the diameter of a star and how reliable are these calculations? Um, the size of stars is interesting because we measure the size of stars very rarely uh, in astronomy. When a look at, we look out in space, we tend to see the positions of stars and their brightness. If we have some way to measure their distance, then that brightness can convert to their luminosity. And then for everything else, for the other quantities of a star that we might want to know, fundamentally their mass and their size, we actually have to use a model. So very few stars have their sizes directly observed because stars are physically small compared to the distance to them, which is trillions of miles, so like the sun is uh, you know a million miles across but it's trillions of miles away so the stars are you know millions of times smaller than the distance to them and that gives you a sense of how small they will appear in the sky as a result we only measure with telescopes or astronomy techniques interferometry the sizes of the largest nearest stars in particular supergiant stars not stars like the sun and certainly not far away but our model of stellar evolution and star uh, properties is pretty robust. And so when we know the luminosity and state of evolution of a star, we can pretty well say what its mass and its size are. They come out of a model. They're not directly observed. The next question is from Wolfhammer 16065. I read recently that there are black holes without event horizons. What would happen to matter as it pro as it approaches the singularity in this case? That's a possibility. Um, it's not clear that that's the case. The speculation is that there may be what are were called naked singularities. This debate came up early in the debates about black holes and the development of black hole theory by Stephen Hawking and Roger Penrose. And in fact, uh, Roger Penrose decided that the it was unlikely or unpalatable enough to, for singularities to be directly visible that he invoked or created what's called the cosmic censorship hypothesis, whereby naked singularities do not exist in nature and they're always veiled by event horizons. Now, well, that's a purely theoretical uh, premise and it would be nice to have some observational handle on this. And it's not really been resolved in the decades since Penrose and Hawking did their original work. So we simply don't know if black holes without event horizons are possible in nature. The more conventional reading of general relativity and the singularity work of Penrose and Hawking is that there's always an event horizon shielding the singularity. Next question is from an email. Uh, since most of the near-miss asteroid events uh, had not been predicted in advance and actually seemed to happen quite often, for example, in 2004 there were two, there was two in 2011, 2013, and almost all large observed impacts had not been predicted, like the Chelyabinsk asteroid, or only a few hours in advance. How realistic are asteroid tracking programs for finding asteroids that are going to impact the Earth? Well they have their limitations. Um, the, the program that Congress mandated NASA find all near-Earth asteroids a uh, kilometer or larger has been successful, and so 90% of those are known. But those that's pretty big. 
the Chelyabinsk object was meters across, okay? So we'd have no way of tracking the much smaller types of debris. And most of the near Earth situations or the near misses that we've read about in recent years where an object flies by the Earth or between the Earth and the Moon and relatively close to us are much smaller objects than the ones that NASA can reliably track further out. Uh, it would be beyond our means essentially to get a full catalog through the inner solar system of objects that were say 10 meters or 50 meters across. Uh, 10 meters, 50 meters, that's the range of the Tunguska impact. And obviously such objects can cause regional devastation. So the fact that we can't even track them all and find out where they are before they get close to the Earth is a bit of a problem. We can find the planet destroying asteroids and we know where they are but not the smaller ones that will cause regional havoc and would of course kill lots of people if they came. However, we do pick them up with telescopes pretty quickly when they're rapidly moving and that does give us some advance notice. Uh, the next question is from one of our live participants. Which celestial bodies in the solar system are most likely to be colonized in your opinion? Well, the uh, moon is the obvious candidate because it's the closest, just a, you know, um, 240,000 miles away, quarter of a million miles. So the moon is obvious because we've been there before. We have fairly advanced plans for how to set up a, a base there of how to mine the lunar, lunar regolith or the soil to build, to make building material, to extract oxygen, um, to make rocket fuel and air that you can breathe and potentially add nutrients and grow crops. So the moon is the obvious candidate. The next best is Mars. But remember in travel distance, if not time, uh, Mars is about a hundred times further away than the moon. Uh, so it's a much heavier lift. It's a much harder object to colonize. And everywhere beyond that is we're talking about the outer solar system, and those are distances even larger. Those are distances heading up to about a billion kilometers. So it's hard to imagine colonization of any outer solar system location for 50 or 100 years. Um, the next question is kind of a follow-up to a previous one. Um, with what amount of certainty, or can we say with certainty that there was a singularity at, at the Big Bang? That's a, an interesting question because the simplistic view of the Big Bang is that it was a singularity. That if you trace time backwards, uh, the expanding universe, the gravitational, uh, you know, the gravitational force is so intense uh, that it sort of self-focuses. And so a naive extrapolation of the Big Bang towards what we would call time zero is that it would have infinite density uh, and actually infinite space curvature as well in general relativity. So that's a simplistic uh, assumption of projection back to a singularity. However, we now have a theory for what happened very early in the history of the universe. It's the inflationary idea. And it's the idea that essentially from the vacuum of space, quantum fluctuation spawned uh, exponentially expanding space time, which flattened the universe and made it far less occupied by matter until it continued on its sedate Hubble expansion. Now, the interesting thing about inflation is that inflation doubles and doubles and doubles again, or exponentially expands a tiny initial quantum-sized patch of space-time to a much larger region of space-time, but it doesn't do it from zero. And so the inflationary model is actually takes away the idea of a singularity for the Big Bang. So if inflation was correct, then the Big Bang need not have been a singularity. And there are other cosmological models um, that resolve the idea of a singularity for the Big Bang. There was a no-boundary cosmology developed by Stephen Hawking uh, back in the 80s. Uh, there's the ekpyrotic universe model, which is based on string theory and brains, where our three-dimensional universe plus one of time uh, emerged from the collisions of higher dimensional membranes or multidimensional spaces. And that also does not need a singularity. So I think at the moment, it's fair to say that the Big Bang does not require that there be a singularity at the beginning. The next question is from one of our live viewers 
again. Uh, can you comment on the recent findings of a new map of dark matter made with the help of artificial intelligence, which shows bridges made up of dark matter that are connecting the galaxies? Um, sure. The people are using simulations, very sophisticated simulations that not just have dark matter particles, but normal particles in it. So you can see the difference between the normal stuff that we're made of and where the stars and galaxies are and the dark matter that's the pervasive component of the universe, six times more dominant. Dark matter does, of course, feel gravity, and so it does cluster. And these simulations and the ones that are assisted by AI uh, just are very efficient ways of delineating the structures. Um, and so it's, these are nice, beautiful simulations, actually. Computing power involved is prodigious. Um, and dark matter does have amazing structures in the universe. Uh, you know, filamentary, cell-like, soap bubbles. You can use various homely or terrestrial analogies to describe the structure of the universe of dark matter, but it's, it's very complex. Space Time, who's on with us live, would like to know, what, according to you, will be the fate of the universe? Is it Big Crunch or Big Rip? Well, it might not be either. The Big Crunch is the eventual reversal of the Hubble expansion and essentially the time working like a mirror, so we see everything getting closer and closer together into a Big Crunch, which is a compression back to a state of very high density that we started from. There's almost certainly not enough matter in the universe for that to happen. In other words, the universe is open geometrically. The big rip is, an, is a scenario based on dark energy, but it's a dramatic one which holds that dark energy has a particular form that the accelerating expansion will propagate down to smaller and smaller scales in a crescendo that eventually will rip apart matter and space-time itself. That requires dark energy to have a very particular property, an evolutionary property. And at the moment, it's not clear that dark matter has that property. So the Big Rip is not a generic um, prediction of cosmology with dark energy. It's a prediction of a particular form of dark energy. And best data and evidence at the moment suggests that that's not the universe we live in. The dark energy will continue an ever-increasing expansion, and, but not in this exponential and catastrophic way. So we sort of touched on these questions, uh, but Muskin Koradia asks, what are the differences between the theory of relativity and quantum mechanics? And why do they not, uh, why do they seemingly not agree in their descriptions of the universe? Well, it's a good question. The, the, uh, the, theory, the quantum theory is based on microscopic behavior of atoms and particles, and it is about the physics that governs the behavior of these subatomic entities. And it turns out this behavior is probabilistic. It involves the uncertainty principle. It involves wave functions that describe how particles behave and evolve. And it's a self-consistent view of microscopic behavior. Relativity is, is a quite different theory because it's a geometric theory. General relativity is a theory where the basic ingredient is what are called manifolds, which are geometric constructs, in this case, of space-time. They can be purely mathematical and have no relevance to a universe. A manifold is a mathematical term. But in general relativity, manifolds describe space-time. And that space-time is fundamentally smooth, but it can have very complex geometry or topology. So the real distinction between quantum theory and relativity is that Quantum mechanics deals with the grainy behavior of the microscopic world at the level of individual particles, whereas general relativity believes deals with large-scale properties and it involves fundamentally smooth and continuous distributions of properties like space-time. Next question is from Shelley Joy, who would like to know, um, is the electromagnetic spectrum of our planet Earth generated from some vibration in the solid planetary core does the peak wavelength coincide with the peak generated by the sun? So we'll split those into two. Is the electromagnetic spectrum of our planet Earth generated from some vibration in the solid planetary core? As seen from afar, uh, what our, how our planet presents in the electromagnetic spectrum is that it presents as a thermal spectrum because the planet has an equilibrium temperature. 
That equilibrium temperature is defined by our distance from the sun and the solar radiation. Of course, the Earth-Sun distance varies slightly, so that temperature varies, and the direct radiation of the sun varies on where you are on the planet. But that equilibrium temperature would make a thermal spectrum with peaks in the infrared. And so the electromagnetic radiation of our planet is essentially infrared radiation peaking in the mid part of the infrared, uh, the invisible infrared. So these are shorter wavelengths than the eye can see. And the sec I missed the second part. Um, basically, uh, they'd like to know if um, the peak wavelength coincides with the peak of the sun's uh, 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 visible wavelength as well. No, so the, the the radiation of the Earth and the radiation of the Sun uh, are, are different. They have different thermal temperatures and so different peak wavelengths. The Sun's temperature is the, really the temperature of the surface. The fusion core, where the energy is coming out, has temperature of 10 million Kelvin or higher. And if you could see that, it would be x-rays. But on the way, on their way diffusing out through the Sun's cooler outer layers, those x-rays degrade to visible light. And the visible surface of the sun that we see has a temperature about 5,700 Kelvin. And so that's the sun's temperature, and its peak wavelength is, as we would imagine, in the visible spectrum, making it appear yellow. The Earth's temperature is uh, 10 times cooler than the sun's surface temperature, and so that radiation comes out at a 10 times longer wavelength, which puts it in the infrared. Excellent. Um, I think we are going to take one more question because we have a stream coming up after this and I need a break in between. So we will take the question from Ellie Bradshaw, who would like to know, do asteroids and other small rocks have their own gravity in space? Uh, yes, every object with mass has gravity. And so asteroids uh, even tiny dust particles, even single subatomic particles have gravity. It's just that when you get down to the level of single particles or dust grains, electrostatic or electromagnetic forces tend to be stronger than gravity. But objects, space rocks like asteroids, meteors, and so on, they definitely have their gravity. Now, their gravity, they tend to respond to the gravity of the dominant object in the solar system, which is the sun. And so those asteroids are either in orbit around the sun or if there are comets or space rocks, they're on looping elliptical orbits around the sun. But those objects definitely have their gravity. Their gravity is quite weak, as we saw when we tried to rendezvous a spacecraft at some of these space rocks. We see that the gravity is so weak that it's actually extremely hard to land on a comet or a meteor or an asteroid uh, because the gravity just doesn't stick the spacecraft to the object. It's far, very easy for it to just bounce or careen off. Um, so, so it makes a challenge for rendezvousing and landing on these small objects that their gravity is so weak. But it does exist, and it just scales, as Newton said, with the mass of the object. Okay, thanks for varied questions. I imagine next time we'll get questions about the Pentagon UFO report that's going to drop sometime today. I haven't seen it drop yet, but it's due to go to Congress today. Anyway, thanks for your questions, and... Uh, to Matthew for facilitating and Vicki too. And uh, we'll be with you in a couple of weeks. Excellent. Thank you, everyone. We are so glad to have you all here today. And we will talk to you later. Take care.